want to welcome you this morning to the Springs Church, and uh, I want to let you know that I'm really glad that you're here, and also those of you tuning in by way of uh, YouTube, I'm glad that you're here today as well. Um, I want to take a little bit of a different approach on the message today, uh, because in the past, we've talked about questions that you've asked uh, during our Easter survey, like, how do you handle stress, or how do I hear the voice of God? Or how do I know what God's specific will is in my life? But today I want to answer a question that maybe you've not asked directly, uh, but, but maybe you've wondered about it. Uh, someone actually did ask me directly um, this question, and it's, Pastor, what is your greatest hope for the body of Christ? And it kind of sent me on a journey to really think about, like, what he, what he was really asking me is, like, what's, what's your core message? Like, if, if you could preach one last sermon before, before you're gone uh, to eternity, like, what would that message be? And I thought about it, I struggled with it, and, and I look at the scripture, and, and I think I have, I'm going to try my best to articulate what that greatest hope looks like uh, for you, and what, and, and and if you're just new here, kind of kicking the tires of this church, thinking, well, what's this church all about? What's this pastor believe in? Like, what's what's this hope? I hope this message helps you to understand a little bit more about uh, what we're about here. Um, if you're a regular, a regular attender here, and you're part of our church family, what I really hope this message will do is to refresh your sense of purpose. Refresh your sense of purpose. And for some of us, I hope it lights a fire under our rear ends, to be honest with you. Can I, can I go ahead and just say it plain like that? So if you're here today, I really want you to open your ears, open your hearts uh, to what the Holy Spirit may be wanting to speak to us as a body and speak to you individually as a member of the body of Christ. So uh, with that said, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, look to your word. And I pray, Lord, that somehow, some way you would take my words today and that you would use them as your words and that our hearts would be wide open. Our minds would be wide open to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said, amen. 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 Thank you for joining joining along, I mean, bearing with me with my voice. I tried not to sing too loud today so that I could save my voice for you right now. Um, But let me begin by echoing what, what Jesus said. Anytime we think about the mission of the church and what our greatest hope is for the church, we, we really need to start with the words of Jesus. And if you will look, at, look in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, starting there, I want to read this to you, and it says this, you, church, you are the world's light. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill glowing in the night for all to see. Now, I think that we can, as we look around this world, we see the darkness. Amen? We look about, we watch the news, we see the shootings, we see the fighting and the politics and and all the problems that our world is facing, and we see a lot of darkness, in that world. And there's no doubt in my mind that we are actually living in the end times, which makes what I'm about to share with you even more important and urgent. Because Jesus said, you are the world's light. You, not somebody else. No, God's plan, listen, God's plan for the light in this world is his church. That's plan A, and he doesn't have a plan B. Okay, I want you to think about this. A city on a hill. You're a city on a hill glowing in the night for all to see. And it's like, God, what's the answer? 
to all this darkness that's happening in the world. And God says clearly in his word, Jesus says, you are the answer. The church is the hope of the world. The church of Jesus Christ, the true church of Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He goes on to say, don't hide your light. Let it shine for all. Let your good deeds glow for all to see. Why? So that they, the world, the darkness, will praise your heavenly Father. In other words, you let your light so shine. If you will love on people, if you will live generously, if you will live your life Christ-like, if you will make your faith public and not some private hidden thing, if you will do that, then the world will take notice and they will praise your Father who is in heaven. When you let your light shine, you can trust that the world will see it. And we don't need to hide it. And they will praise your Father in heaven. Now let me give you a statement that uh, may be surprising for, su for some of you. Uh, but I hope that it's challenging for all of us to see the church and the mission, the role of the church in a fresh way. So jot this down if you're taking notes with me. It's this. The church does not exist for us. Rather, the church, we are the church, and we exist for the world. Okay. So it's not, about, it's not about us, our preferences, what we like, what color is the carpet, how, many, how do we like our chairs, well, how's the paint, or our preferences. No, it's not about any of that. And what, what is the church's tendency to do? We have a tendency to turn inward. And we make everything about us. We make everything about our preferences. We make everything about our comforts. When in fact, we are the church. The church is not this building. No, the people of God are the church. And we exist to be a light in this world. Amen? Amen? Now, uh, that's our foundation. We have to start there by recognizing that we are the people of God. And we are God's plan A to be the light in this dark world. Are you following with me so far? Okay. I believe God has a bright and a powerful future for his church. That even though this world may get darker and darker, the church of Jesus Christ will grow brighter and brighter. And I think we're going to see a, a revival across our nation and across our world like we've never seen before. People coming into the kingdom by the thousands and the, and the millions, literally. As things get worse and worse, the church will have an opportunity, if we are open to it, the church will have an opportunity to shine in a way that we've never shown before. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> I want to tell you this. One of the things that, that grieves my heart. Uh, I talked to a pastor uh, a few months ago. And he was telling me things. I was telling him what's going on in our church. He was telling me what's going on in his church. And he said... Um, you know, he, he, he had a smaller congregation, maybe about uh, 50, 75 people in there. And uh, he, he said, I, I don't really want our church to grow. He said, uh, our people are happy. They're comfortable. They like each other. Everybody's getting along well. We don't need to grow. We just want to focus on God. And, 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 and that's it. And, and I thought to myself, uh, and I was saddened in my heart, and I, and I thought, well, bummer for all the lost people in your community. That's really unfortunate for your community, that you don't want to reach people for Jesus Christ. 
And I thought to myself, Lord, I don't ever want to be that kind of pastor. I don't want to, I don't want to be an, an inward kind of leader. I want to always be looking, who can we reach? What outreach can we do? Are we equipping the saints or are we just going through the motions and playing church on Sundays? Like, what are we really, really doing here? The church does not exist for us. Rather, we are the church. And we exist for the world. I want to give you a prophetic verse. And by that, I just mean I feel like it's a verse for right now for, for you. It's a verse in Isaiah chapter 60. And Isaiah is quoting God here. And he says this. This is Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 through 3. He says this, hey church, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. What's the glory? The Hebrew word for glory is kabod. It just means the weighty presence of God, or all that God is, all of his power, all of his might, all of his wisdom. That's the glory of God. And maybe you've never really considered this thought before that God wants to put his glory upon his church. Maybe you, let's just make it personal. God wants to put his glory, his fullness upon you. Have you ever considered that? Like he wants to put the full weight of his presence upon you. He wants to put his power and anointing upon you. You, his church. And he goes on to say in Isaiah, see that darkness. That darkness covers the earth and that thick darkness is over the people. But guess what? God's got a solution. We've talked about it earlier. It's the same solution. He says, he says this, but the Lord rises upon you church but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn what's the point of this God wants to use you pastor what's your core message what's your what's your greatest hope for the church it is to is that it is that you would understand that God wants to use you he wants to work in your life. He wants to work through your life to be a light in this dark world. And I'm preaching better than your amen. And <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I want to give you a statement. Okay, or jot this down if you're taking mo if you're, I love to teach and exhort the word of God. So if you've got a pen and paper, go ahead and grab that because I'm going to give you always some stuff to write down. Every Sunday, but I'm going to give you a statement and I want you to grab hold of this. Some, some of you, this is just going to go in one ear and out the other, but some of you, you're going to really receive this and you're going to understand it in a very fresh way in your life, okay? First part is this I want you to write it down. I am a minister. Now I'm talking to every single person here. You are a minister. Guess what? Pastor Brian, Pastor Adam, Pastor Rory, we are not the only ministers in the building. Amen? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're a child of the living God, you've been born again because of the, the grace of God and the faith that you placed in Jesus Christ, guess what? You have been called into ministry. You are a minister. Now, some of you, this is putting on a light bulb. You're saying, no, I thought I'd just come to church and the minister just preaches the word. No, no, no. God says, you are a minister. You are part of my solution to this dark world. You are the light of this world. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he says, but you, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why? 
that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. To be a minister means that you are a servant of God, a servant of Jesus Christ, and a servant to other people. In the Bible, the term minister is actually a, a nursing term. It means one who brings help, one who brings aid, one who brings life. You, my friends, are a minister. The truth is you can be used of God just as much as I can, and probably in greater ways, because you can influence people that I cannot influence. You can speak to people. You've been through things that I've never gone through, and you have the ability from God to speak life into people who relate to you who would never be able to relate to me. You have to understand that as a body as a body member of Christ, you are a minister. You see, I don't know if you, kn you know this or not, but you're a minister when you clean the church building. You're a minister when you run the sound or the computer during our services. You're a minister when you lead or participate in our life group ministries. You're a, you're a minister when you serve on our prayer team and you get those lists of, of prayer needs every single week and you pray over them fervently. You are, you are a minister. You're a minister if you serve as a greeter or an usher at church. You're a minister if you set up signs and banners at our church. You're a minister my Lord, you're a superstar minister if you serve with our kids each and every week. Amen? Amen. I live with three of them, so I can say that. Um, <clears throat> and if you do anything to help somebody else in the name of Jesus, guess what? That is ministry. That is serving. That is serving God. That is serving the people that God has put in to your life. And, and forget life in, within the church walls. I mean, you think about your, your work life. You think about your family. You're a minister when you go home and you lead your church, men. I mean, you lead your home. You lead your family, right? You're a minister when you go and you serve them or when you bless your kids or, or instruct them in the Word of God. What is that? You are a minister, what about at your workplace? You go to work and you influence people. Listen, God loves those people at your workplace so much that he sent you there to be a missionary. To reach them. To invest in them. To love on them. It doesn't have to be just serving within a church. Think about, we got you here for an hour and a half, right? You, get, you live the rest of your life uh, at your workplace and at your home. You are a minister. Pastor, what would you tell people that your greatest hope is for the body of Christ? Is for the body of Christ to truly realize that they are called as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and not only as a minister in a broad and random sense, but a minister, this is the second part of the sentence I'm giving you, a minister with a specific purpose. You have a very specific purpose. God designed you in a very particular way, giving you certain gifts, giving you certain passions and experiences. And I like to say it this way, your design helps to reveal your destiny. Like how you're wired is a clue to your purpose in life. I read a stat a while back. It said 80%, 87% of people who attend church in America do not know what their God-given purpose is. That breaks my heart. And what God has put in me is this desire to help the body of Christ Wake up and say, hey, what, what's your purpose here? Let me help you discover it. 
Let me help you begin to walk in it. I want to encourage you as you go along to live out what God has called you to do. I mean, think about it this way. Think about if, if your body, what would your body look like and act like if 87% of it didn't know what it was supposed to do? It would be chaotic. There would be no order. There would be no function. You'd be walking around like this, right? Like your different body parts wouldn't have anything. They wouldn't have any understanding. They'd be like, well, I'm a hand, but I, I don't really don't know if what I should be connecting to. But every hand needs to connect to an arm and an elbow and a shoulder. And it's like, what would, what would your human body look like, act like, and feel like if 87% of it didn't know its purpose? So when I read a stat like 87% of the body of Christ doesn't understand their role, no wonder sometimes our churches can be very dysfunctional, right? So my hope and my constant prayer is that God, help us to know why we're here on earth. Help us to really experience freedom in Christ. Help us to understand and really grasp our God-given purpose, our reason for being. <clears throat> I read an illustration by, uh, uh, about Elvis Presley. You guys know Elvis, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, he was called the king, right, of rock and roll. He died in 1977 at the age of 42 from obesity, from drug use. He was extremely famous, right? He sold a billion adult, uh, albums. He made uh, 33 movies. There are Elvis impersonators everywhere, especially in this city. People think Elvis must have really loved his life. No. Not true. I read something from his wife, Priscilla. Uh, put, it, put it up on the screen. I want you to think about this. Elvis never came to terms with who he was meant to be or what his purpose in life was. He thought he was here for a different reason, maybe to preach, maybe to serve others, maybe to save, maybe to care for people. That agonizing desire was always with him, and he knew he wasn't fulfilling it. So he'd go up on that stage so he wouldn't have to think about it. And friends, my sober encouragement for each one of you, don't live your life and never come to terms with who you were meant to be. Don't live your life and never find out what your purpose is. It's time for us to understand that we are ministers and we do have a specific purpose to do for God. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite scriptures in the New Testament. It says this, verse 10, for we, the church, are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, and if you're around this church uh, for any length of time at all, you're going to hear me say this. You were made on purpose for a purpose. You're not here. You're not one of a million. You are one of a kind. And I want to encourage you. Find out what that purpose is. Whatever you need to do, whoever you need to talk to, how much ever time you need to spend in prayer, in study, find out how God wants to use your life. He wants to use you. It's his plan to use the body of Christ as a light to this dark world. Amen? Yeah. Next part of the sentence is this. At an opportune time. This is really important. One of the greatest things to realize is that out of, out of 
all the timeline of history, God ordained that you would live now and that you would live here at an opportune time. You know, I was thinking about some of us are interpreting the news, the things that we watch, the media. We're interpreting it the wrong way. Some of us are getting stressed out. Some of us are getting mad and doing things, saying things, typing things, texting things. All the things that we do in that regard, we're getting worried, we're getting depressed, we're getting so angry. And although things are are getting darker and darker, we should be saying, hallelujah. Thanks be to God that I get to be alive right now and right here to shine the light of the gospel in the, into the darkness. I mean, we are the church. We have the answer. Amen? And his name is Jesus. And so when we see this darkness surrounding us and trying to consume us, we shouldn't be stressed and angry. We should be thankful and saying, thank God that he put me here, right here and right now, so that I can be a light in this dark world. We don't have to let the darkness in, folks. We have the hope of Jesus Christ living inside of us. The Bible says that greater is he who is in us than he who is in this world. Let us not be discouraged or anxious or depressed or worried about what we see around us. No. We have the hope of glory inside of us. Ephesians chapter 5 over in verse 15 and 16, Paul encourages us and he says this, be very careful then. That means pay close attention how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of what? Every opportunity. Because why? Why? The days are evil. Let me encourage you. Every single day, God will give you opportunities. And what if you made it a daily prayer that, God, would you order my steps today that I might be a minister to somebody in need today? Do you think God would answer a prayer like that? Yes. Every single time. So at an opportune time, and I want to finish the statement with this, to make an eternal difference. To make an eternal difference. You see, our purpose here is not just to do good, but it's to do good in Jesus' name. Amen? We are called to reach people to evangelize, to make disciples. We are called to plunder hell and populate heaven. I mean, we have a mission. We have things that we need to accomplish and things that we need to do as the body of Christ. You read the scripture and we're here to preach and teach the gospel. We're here to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to raise the dead. I mean, we're here to flow in the power of God. I mean, when was the last time you and I flowed in the power of God and the gifts of the Spirit were demonstrated in and through our lives? And when was the last time that we had that fruit of the Spirit just oozing out of our ears where we're able to walk in love no matter who cuts us off on the freeway, right? We're able to walk in patience and kindness and peace and joy. I mean, God has so much for the body of Christ and we stop short way too often. But God has called us to make a difference. He's called us because heaven and hell are real. 
And there is a lot at stake. He's called us to make an eternal difference. It says this in 1 Corinthians 3. Paul said, if any man builds on this foundation, using things like gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, look at these, ne these next few words. His work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, the day of Jesus Christ, the day where he returns, that day will bring it to light. In other words, you'll see what you did really matters if what you did shows up in eternity. Does that make any kind of sense? So in our decisions, in the way that we view things, People, our, our, the way that we handle our money, the way that we act in our marriage and in our family and in our workplace. Are we making decisions with eternity in mind? Or are we just going through the day to day without thinking of eternity at all? Because that day when Jesus returns, he will bring to light what we have done. So because you asked for it, or maybe you didn't, my core message, my greatest hope for the body of Christ is in that statement. If you didn't get a chance to write it down, I want you to write it down now. We're going to review it one more time. My hope and my prayer if I could preach one last message to my brothers and my sisters, it would be this. You are a minister with a specific purpose at an opportune time to make an eternal difference. This is what burns in my heart. This is the vision of our church. I want you to know God. To know God is to know eternal life. I want you to find freedom. I want you to connect with other people in the body. I want you to learn to Bible study together and pray together and encourage each other together. Boy, I want you to discover your purpose. These are not words that, I, that we just say week in and week out. This is our heart. This is our passion. And this is, this is crucially important based upon God's plan in the word of God. And I want you, I want you to end up making a huge difference. I want you to serve in whatever capacity you can, however you're wired in our church. I want you to make a difference leading your home. I want you to make a difference serving those in your home and investing those into those in your workplace. Like I am praying for you every single day that you would know these things. That you would know in your heart of hearts, yes, I am a minister. Yes, I have a specific purpose. Yes, God wants to use me here and now to make an eternal difference in the life of somebody else. If we're sitting at Starbucks, that's what I'm telling you. If we're riding an elevator together and I have 30 seconds to speak into your life, that's what I'm telling you. That's my prayer. And that's my hope for you. So you may be here and you're like, okay, well, I get it, Pastor, but where do I start? And maybe I'm kind of new to this thing. I'm still figuring out where God wants me to be as far as a home church goes. But I would tell you the following things and jot these down if you're taking notes with me. More than just jotting it down, I want you to let it into your heart. Number one is this. Go all in with Jesus. 
how are you going to find your ministry? How are you going to know your purpose? How are you really going to make a difference? Well, you're not unless you go all in with Jesus. And your relationship with him. He must be your first love. Don't ever grow stagnant or lazy in your relationship with God. No, keep it fresh. Keep it fiery. Keep it full of passion and love for Him. Why? You're not trying to earn anything from Him. No. It's our response to His love. Is we love Him because why? He first loved us. Go all in with Jesus Christ and see how He would want to transform your life. Number two thing I would tell you is this. Go all in with his church. Go all in with his church. Not halfway. Not lukewarm. Not one foot on this side and one foot on the other side. No, all the way in. Boy, I know it can be scary, but you'll never reach your purpose in life. You'll never discover unless you go all in with Jesus and with his church. And you may say, well, pastor, the church has hurt me. Well, guess what? The church has hurt me too. But Jesus said this, that the church is his bride. And if we love the bridegroom, who are we to hate his bride? If we love Jesus, we should love who he loves. And he loves his church. And so if you've been hurt by the church, I want to encourage you, like, forgive, move on, talk to people, make things right as far as it depends upon you, and go all in with his church. I want you to think about, are there any barriers in your life, in your thinking, that is causing you not to go in all with Jesus or not to go all in with his church. Because I, I got some encouragement for you. Perhaps God wants to remove those barriers today. So that you can go in with your whole heart. Are you guys still following with me? Okay. My prayer is that you get plugged in to community. My prayer is that you use your God-given resources, your gifts, your talents to serve his church, and to make a difference through the church. And number three is this. I'll go ahead and invite uh, Star to play uh, softly for me. But number three is this. Go all in to reach out. And remember, the natural thing for us to do is to turn inward, right? We have to be very intentional to be an outward-focused people, Reach out. Who can you reach out to in in your neighborhood, in your family, in your workplace, in your sphere of influence? Who can you share your testimony with? Who can you begin to invest in? Who can you invite to church? Who can you lead to Christ yourself? Guess what? I'm not the only minister in the building. You can lead people to Christ yourself. Do you know how? Do you know what to lead them through? Do you know the plan of salvation? Do you really understand it? Are you equipped? And if not, why not? God wants to use you. What is your next step to allow God to use you to be that light? In this dark world. Go all in. With outreach. Let me ask you a question. Now I'm being very serious about this. Okay. It may sound a a little funny. Like I'm joking about it. But I'm not. But let me ask you this. As far as outreach goes. Do you have to wait. For the church to plan something. For you to do outreach. Absolutely not. 
Do you have to wait for your life group to plan an event and do something corporately in order for you to do something for God to reach out to your community and your sphere of influence? No. What do you need to wait for? You need to wait for an opportunity from God. Like I said earlier, if you pray a prayer like this every single day, Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would use me to minister to somebody in need today. If you prayed a prayer like that every single morning, do you think God will put people in your path that you can minister to? Yes, absolutely. The only thing that you need is the opportunity from God to serve and to make a difference. It doesn't matter if the church plans something corporately, which we're going to do. It doesn't matter if life groups plans things together to reach out to their community, which they're going to do. And we've done many things in the past, but don't wait. That's my point. You don't have to wait on a corporate plan or a corporate event in order to be used by God to reach out to somebody in need. Thank you for that thunderous silence. It's beautiful. Number number four is this. This is my encouragement for all of you. Never turn back. Never shrink away. Never turn around. Never stop going. Never stop growing. Never get discouraged and just throw in the towel. No. Jesus had every reason to throw in the towel, but, but what did he do? He picked it up. You read that in the, in the Gospels, you find out that Jesus picked up the towel. He washed his disciples' feet. Never give up. Never turn around. I feel like there may be somebody here today, you're kind of on the brink. Where you're thinking to yourself, do I, do I really don't have what it takes? How can I go on another day? How could God ever use a person like me? And pastor, this all sounds good, but this is just not real in my life. Let me tell you, the love of God will chase us down. The love of God will keep us moving forward. The love of God will never, ever give up on us. So let me encourage you. Let me exhort you and challenge you today. Never turn back. There's a song that's been on repeat in my, uh, in my playlist lately. And it goes, the words are like this. I have decided to follow my Jesus. I've decided. I've made a decision and I'm not changing it. I, my decision is resolute. It's concrete. Never turning back. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. Absolutely no chance of turning back. So pastor, what's your, what's your greatest hope? Man, my greatest hope is that you will know that you are a minister with a specific purpose at an opportune time to make an eternal difference. And my challenge to you all is to go all in with Jesus, go all in with his church, go all in with outreach, and never turn back. Would you stand up with me, please? Let's just enter into a time of prayer with the Lord. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for your encouragement, Lord. Father, I pray that you would strengthen each one of us to obey you in our next step 
you always have a next step for each one of us. Father, give us the strength and the courage to take our next step with you. Church, if you're here today and this me- God has spoken to you through this message, I just want you to raise up your hand to the Lord and say, Lord, I hear you. Lord, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. No matter what it costs me, no matter what it feels like, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. You can put your hands down. If you're here today and You've never confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I want to give you that opportunity now to begin your relationship with him. And friends, this is not something that you do that's, in, that's the end. This is just the beginning of a wonderful spiritual journey with Jesus, with, with discipleship with Jesus transforming your life, but this is the first step, and that's being born again, turning away from your sin and turning wholeheartedly to God and confessing Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. So if that's you, I just want you to pray this prayer after me. I want everybody to repeat after me, please. Heavenly Father, I repent for being master of my own life and living separate from you. And I turn away from my sin. And I turn towards you. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me today. And I welcome you, Holy Spirit, into my life right now. Jesus, please baptize me with the Holy Spirit. By faith, I receive him now. Thank you, Father, for filling me with the power of the Holy Spirit so that I might make a difference and be a light in this dark world. In Jesus' name I ask, believe and receive. Amen. Amen.